Today we are talking ice cream, which is one of my favorite topics, obviously because it's delicious, but also because my PhD research was on the structure of ice cream, so it's very special to me. Now, what I want to talk about is ice cream has a lot of ingredients you, you might be familiar with and sort of expect like cream or sugar or milk, but it also has a long list of ingredients you might not recognize, something like lecithin or monoantiglycerides. So what I want to talk about today is why are these unfamiliar ingredients being added to our ice cream? First, let's look at the two ingredient statements of the ice creams I have here. So like I said, I have Ben and Jerry's and Blue Bunny. So Ben and Jerry's is probably considered the more premium one of the two. It's more expensive. And I just want to look at the ingredient statement and see sort of what ingredients might, might be unfamiliar to most people. And on Ben and Jerry's, I have three in mind. So they have soy lecithin, guar gum, and carrageenan. So if I were to categorize these ingredients that are unfamiliar, I would say soy lecithin is an emulsifier and the two other ones, the guar gum and carrageenan, are hydrocolloids. Hydrocolloids are typically known for their thickening ability. So that's Ben and Jerry's. I think there's three that would be, you know, most people wouldn't recognize as food ingredients. If we move to Blue Bunny, they have a much longer ingredient statement. So this is probably the cheaper version of ice cream. And so uh, I have a longer list of ingredients most people might not know. So first, again, I see soy lecithin, mono and diglycerides. There is guar gum, again, terra gum, carrageenan, locust bean gum, and cellulose gum. So a lot longer list of things you might not be familiar with. But again, what's interesting is if I were to characterize these ingredients, I would say lecithin and monodiglycerides, that is in the category of emulsifiers. And all the other ones here, those are known as hydrocolloids. So what I'm trying to show you is these ingredients, we can group them into emulsifiers and hydrocolloids, which means we're adding them for very specific reasons, which I'll go into in a bit. Before I get into why these unfamiliar ingredients are being added, I think it'd be really helpful to look at the structure of ice cream because it sort of helps explain why we need these ingredients. And the structure of ice cream is actually super complex and unique. So it's really interesting. For, so for just one minute, let's pretend we have just like a little square slab of ice cream and we slip it under a microscope. So what you would see, let's start with air cells or air bubbles. So ice cream can be about 50% air. So what you would see is these tiny, finely dispersed air bubbles or air cells within the structure of ice cream. And now a lot of air can be used in ice cream because it's a cheap ingredient. Producers like to use cheaper free ingredients, right? But we use air because that is what makes ice cream so light and fluffy are all these tiny air bubbles interspersed throughout the ice cream. The next thing you might notice is ice crystals. So of course we freeze ice cream, which means the liquid water turns into ice. And these ice crystals, you want them to be really, really small because when they are small, ice cream tastes really smooth to us. But if these ice crystals grow larger, it sort of gives a coarse texture to the product. So we want small ice crystals within the ice cream. The next thing you might notice is fat globules. So those are those yellow spheres. And free fat globules are those ones just sort of floating around alone. What's really important for ice cream is that some of these fat globules come together to form fat clusters. So when hundreds or even thousands of these fat globules come into contact, they only partially merge. So if two come together, they only partially merge. And if you add a third one, it just partially merges with the two and you could add another one and another one. And what this makes is a really expansive fat network. And these fat networks 
are what give ice cream sort of its stand-up properties. They lend a lot of strength to ice cream and help it resist melting or collapsing under gravity. So for ice cream structure, you absolutely need some of these huge fat clusters. And the last important component of ice cream is sort of just this blank space or the white space that is left within that square of ice cream. And we call this the unfrozen serum phase. And this is just water that hasn't been turned to ice. So not all water in ice cream is frozen. And what's left, that water is the serum phase, which dissolves things like the salts or the sugars. If hydrocolloids are present there in the serum phase, any proteins are dissolved in the serum phase. So basically it's this liquid phase that sort of holds all the other components of the ice cream together. So now that we know the structure of ice cream, let's dive into those ingredients that we sort of don't know anything about because what you'll see is these ingredients we're unfamiliar with, they usually help create this complex structure of ice cream or help maintain it over ice cream shelf life. Now remember I called a lot of those hydrocolloids. So let's talk about hydrocolloids first. And if you watch my video on what's in your salad dressing, you'll know that hydrocolloids were also in the salad dressing we are looking at. But if you haven't seen it, I'll just put the link up here. So hydrocolloids are usually added to act as thickeners. But in ice cream, what they help with is actually sort of inhibiting those ice crystals we saw in the structure from growing bigger and bigger. And the reason we don't want these ice crystals to grow is because it really ruins the texture of ice cream. So small ice crystals, the ice crystals that ice cream is manufactured to have are very, very tiny because that makes ice cream really smooth. But as ice cream is sort of temperature abused, so it warms up, it cools down, you know, someone opens the freezer, closes the freezer, opens the freezer, closes the freezer, that's terrible for ice cream because ice crystals melt, grow bigger, melt and grow bigger and grow bigger. And like I said, we don't want big ice crystals in our ice cream. It just doesn't taste right or more, the texture is really off. So we add hydrocolloids to control ice crystal growth but also because hydrocolloids have this ability to sort of even mask these larger ice crystals. So when large ice crystals are in the ice cream, hydrocolloids can sort of lend the ice cream more creaminess and cover up that iciness of the large, large ice crystals. And there's one last reason we add hydrocolloids, and that's because, as I said, they're thickeners. They sort of give body to the ice cream which means it can help it from melting so fast. So when we have ice cream out at room temperature and it's starting to melt, the thickness that the hydrocolloids give the ice cream, it actually can slow down how fast the ice cream is going to melt. So there's several reasons you might see these hydrocolloids included in an ice cream formulation. The ones I would say that are most popular or most common are hydrocolloids like Guar gum, locust bean gum. So locust bean gum also has a second night name and that is carabine gum. You'll see cellulose and carrageenan a lot. And hydrocolloids, these are all extracted from plants. So they all have plant sources. And let me just give you a couple of sources for locust bean gum. So locust bean gum is from this ancient tree that is grown in the Mediterranean. Guar gum, so guar you, is actually extracted from a bush, I guess, or more specifically the bean that grows on that bush. And cellulose gum, well, a lot of plants just have a cellulose material in them, so they're from plants. And carrageenan, interestingly, that is extracted from red algae. So hydrocolloids, are the, although you might not recognize the names, they all come from plant material. Now to those emulsifiers we didn't recognize. Remember we saw soy lecithin and mono and diglycerides. Another common one you'll see in ice cream is polysorbate 80. And just a heads up, soy lecithin, it's lecithin from soy, but lecithin can also be from egg yolks or egg lecithin as well as sunflowers. So you could see three different forms of lecithin just depending on where it came from. But these emulsifiers, we add them to make the fat globules behave properly and form those big fat clusters. Because originally in the ice cream, each fat globule sort of has this 
huge puffy winter coat on. And this coat is made of the milk protein. So they have this sort of protective protein coating each fat globule, which means when two fat globules come into contact, they sort of just bounce off of one another. They don't partially merge like we need them to. So we need to get rid of this protective protein coating. And we do that by adding these tiny molecules called emulsifiers. And emulsifiers have this special structure where half of them wants to be in the fat and half of them wants to be in the water, which means in ice cream, these emulsifiers go immediately to where a fat globule meets the serum phase. And by doing that, they sort of kick off the protein that was protecting that fat globule. So the emulsifiers replace the protein. And which means that without that protective coating, now when we have two fat globules come into contact, they start to partially merge. And that's how we get those large fat clusters or those fat networks that are just huge and go through the structure of the ice cream to give it strength and integrity. So by adding the emulsifiers, we can get these fat clusters. And the reason we need these fat clusters in the structure of ice cream is they actually reduce how fast uh, ice cream melts because they lend a lot of strength, like I said, to the ice cream. They also make the ice cream taste creamier, so we all perceive the ice cream as creamier. And the fat clusters help to hold in those air cells or help those air cells so they don't collapse under the weight of gravity. So you can see in the picture here, I have those fat clusters near the air cells just to show they help to hold those in the ice cream. So making these fat clusters are really important to get the correct structure of ice cream, which then means we get the characteristic taste and texture of ice cream. Now I know the length of the ingredient statement for processed or mass produced food can get really lengthy, which is overwhelming. And then you add to it that you don't recognize some of the ingredients, which doesn't help at all. But I hope by going over ice cream's ingredient statement and why, you know, these unrecognizable ingredients are added, it helps you to see that they're, they're included for very specific reasons. They usually help maintain the structure of the food, which means that it has the right taste or texture, or they help sort of maintain the quality of the food as it could sit in our freezer for months and months, we can forget about it sometimes. So it just helps maintain the structure over the shelf life of the food. So nothing is just tossed in for fun. Everything has a purpose in ice cream. If you have any other foods you're really curious about or interested why certain ingredients are added, definitely leave a comment below. I am always looking for new ideas. But other than that, I will talk to you next time.